sort of. Are we not seeing much of that? Well, I'm actually going to do a pretty simple so. way. I didn't hear him pay for the call. Okay. He said he wasn't coming. Okay. Um, yeah. And um, are you here for. I had the opportunity to sit through a rather long planning board meeting over in private ways. Okay. And I was interested to see what the outcome was. Involved citizen. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm wondering about dealing with the issues that these people are here for. Well, yeah, right. earlier in the process. Oh, yeah. 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 Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've got a contract for zinc orthophosphate. Are, are you starting? <laughs> what happened to the jury lane discussion? Um, <clears throat> so, we have private ways. Are you only private ways? No, I think it's a regular speaker. 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 No hard Once you get going, I just had an announcement. That's okay. okay, so let's call the meeting to order. It's uh, January or March 27, um, 2013. We're being recorded by Mimi Odgers for North Street Neighborhood Association. Thank you. Uh, first order of business are the minutes of the March 13th Board of Public Works meeting. Move approval. Second. Any questions or comments? All in favor of accepting them as presented? Aye. Aye. Next, we have the minutes of the March 2nd Board of Public Works meeting. Uh, actually, the street hearings on private ways. Second. Second. Any comments on those minutes? All in favor of approving them? Aye. Aye. Minutes of the March 13th Board of Public Works meeting uh, when we were discussing the FY 2014 budget. Move approval. Second. Again, everyone satisfied with those? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And finally, the minutes of the March 15th meeting, also about the fiscal year 14 budget. <coughs> I, was, I was absent. I was absent. approval. You're the only one who's there. No, I was oh, there. You Second. Second. And do you two have any comments about the minutes? No. In favor of accepting them? Aye. Aye. Great. Okay. Uh, next, we have a contract for bituminous concrete, FOB. Yes. Oh, did I was going to Karen is here, and I didn't know if oh. wanted to. Sorry. Why she's here. And we also have. All right. Uh, can I have a motion to take informational number one out of order? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Solid waste planning update. Well, uh, I guess at the last board meeting, you were um, wanted some more information about the commercial customers in the already in place. So you all got this sheet. Um, so I did some extensive research about what the alternatives would be for <coughs> landscapers um, in this area. And initially, they, they weren't very good options because it, um, you'll see that Cotton Tree Services is in there now, but he wasn't in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so they would have had to go to Wheatley, Westfield, West Springfield, Greenfield, or Amherst to dispose of leaves and or brush. But, yeah. I had a question about the notations. I'm guessing CY is cubic yards? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that means they don't have a square. <coughs> um, so I would say that before Cotton Tree Service decided <coughs> to take on other landscapers for account, on an mm -hmm. account basis, that I would have said there were no good options local options for landscapers. By the way, none of these are options for, for residents, really, except for Fair Path Farm would take leaves from residents. But, um, so Farmer's Friend in Belchertown and Smith Oak um, are, were not interested. And when you say not, I, just, you know, I was just confused when I was trying to read this earlier. The current options, these six people, Bear Path through Wagner Wood, are people that would take um, waste from other people Just or landscapers. Other, land, commercial, other landscapers, commercial, but commercial. not from the public. Yeah, except for Bear Path Farm, they would take leaves from the public. The others wouldn't. Okay. So, 
So but they all take commercial. What? They all take commercial aid. Yes. Okay. Land, land. Yeah. yeah. And um, so there are two that weren't interested in all at all. There are five, well, including Bear Pass Farm, should be in that um, Department of Agricultural Resources list. They are registered to take off farm materials, which is what the third move list was coming from off the farm, they have to be um, registered under DAR. But all of those are too far away also. So then be below that is the top 15 customers for in terms of tonnage of yard and roadway stem brush. Um, alternative recycling systems are on the top because they were bringing it from the Hadley transfer station <coughs> and also working with the Hadley BPW, so. So th um, these were annual amounts, the time? Yes, it's a calendar 2012. And the number of trips just shows, you know, how, how active they were with it. And then going down below, so um, basically 22% of all the commercial customers that deliver leaf and yard waste, so let's just say 20%, actually brought in 80% of the tonnage. And um, down below the, the residential yard and leaf waste over the scale, not all of it goes over the scale. Some of it, especially on Saturdays, it was just being sent to the front. <coughs> so it's, this is not an accurate number, it's a low number. But the, for the total yard and leaf waste that's going over the scale, the, the top um, or no, the, all the commercial tonnage only amounted to about a third of all the all the yard and leaf waste and brush going over the scale. And in looking at these numbers, <coughs> is there does this amount to enough income to reconsider any of our? Plans for Glendale Road. What do we charge our commercial operations? Twenty-five dollars a ton. And how's that uh, compared to uh, cubic yards? Do we have any sort of conversion? Well, they when they're estimating, it's um, you know the, the lower end would be a pickup truck, and you know we're talking about hundreds of pounds, not you know, much um, up to. You know, I think there's $125 per load. That that's a huge trailer truck of stuff. I mean, that's a that's probably not the kind of load that we would even be able to accept at the moment. Um, so I guess the question they, I'm trying uh, to get to is how much more yeah. expensive is it going to be for local small landscapers to take their stuff to Cotton Tree Service if that's what we need them with? It will be more expensive. So yeah. Uh, Scale on. Um, actually, I think we're about half the price of, of you know. The, I think that the going rate for this is between forty and fifty dollars a ton. But it's brush is difficult to have a conversion factor for because it's, there's so many variables. I mean, how pack, how tightly they pack it, what kind of diameter it is, and how neatly they've loaded it and so it's difficult to give you it like a tonnage to cubic yardage mm -hmm. kind of okay I just I just need to when I was looking at this I just had some problems and I just want to see if I can summarize it so just yell at me if I'm a little down the wrong path currently the top six people accept yard and yard waste from anybody. I mean from, from commercial landscaping group. Yes. Then we have um, all, uh, alter the alternative recycling systems down to all Allen's roll-off container are people that over 2012 they this is the amount of tonnage that they brought to the landfill. And I, I think I arbitrarily cut it off at Anyone that generated more than five tons. Okay. Well, one, yeah, right, five, I think. So what 
but there isn't except for uh, North Country, and they're right there, mm -hmm. practically. Um, there, there's really not even hardly more than one trip a week for most of these people. Or Joe Squires. Yeah. Long. Yeah. Um, so what I'm thinking is like we're not. It, what this is saying to me is that the, that there are some options. There isn't a sufficient mass of of um, of waste that's being brought to the the um, Lindell Road facility right now, and and we didn't talk about the financial aspect, but it seems like it wouldn't be financially feasible to keep it open based on that. At twenty five hundred dollars, at twenty five dollars a ton, generates seventy eight seventy five. Based on the two thousand and twelve. Yeah. Yeah. That might cover personnel. Would it cover well, personnel? I I think oh. that twenty five dollars a ton is, is really low. Is really low. Yeah. 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 So, but at, on the same time, it seems like what these people have, they might be able to make arrangements in our community with farmers or in the same yeah. way that their path once leaves. Yeah. Actually, it's another research project that, of contacting the farms and seeing which ones might be interested in having specific relationships with landscapers. So I've been, in, I've been researching all the farms from a variety of but I haven't had time to contact them. But, uh, but I have a very good list of farms in, in the area. So Karen, as you were going through the numbers for Glendale, as to whether or not it would be feasible to keep it open, is it is it a close call or is it obvious we can't support it? Um, I had contacted Cotton Tree Service like three times, trying to show him that that there might be an opportunity for his business here. And every, the first couple of times he said no, he wasn't interested. So. Before he said yes, he would add this to his business. I would have, I would have had a different answer to your question. But now I think there is a good local option that it's it's reasonable in cost. But Jim wants to say something. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think when we were meeting with the board subcommittee, we talked about uh, the issue a lot in terms of whether commercial enterprises, whether, whether the city should provide a compost facility for these enterprises. And at the last meeting, we had a gentleman come in, express some concern. Um, just a couple of observations. Um, uh, we had asked Karen to come up with sort of a list of where can people go. Um, so the list is sort of uh, old in that our policy change to not have our comp compost area open to commercial enterprises is recent. So sort of this evolution in the marketplace in terms of what we thought would happen in terms of some private sector enterprise saying, okay, we'll open up shop, that just hadn't really happened yet. Mm -hmm. So when Karen says, you know, if you asked her a week ago, there wouldn't have been a good option. I think we haven't, there hasn't really been a tremendous amount of time for a good option to come into play. Karen spurred a reasonable option with, with Cotton because she started to make phone calls. But on some level, the gentleman that was here I'm sure he must have been sitting in his office making calls to other people like, hey, what's everybody doing with, with right. your commercial stuff? What are we going to do? Actually, they were calling me. City's closing <laughs> down. So, you know, on, on some level, I think, you know, the, the marketplace we expected would be in sort of a state of evolution for that niche to be filled by somebody. And Cotton apparently has offered to do it. Um, we talked about price a little bit here, 15 a cubic yard. Maybe somebody else will come in and offer to do it cheaper, or whatever the circumstances are. It's really impossible to predict. But um, I think part of it was just the basic discussion within the city about is this a commercial enterprise that the city should be involved in? And um, it can be expensive in terms of taking the material in and managing it. And then once you have all the material, you need to move it or distribute it or something else. So um, we never really get into a point where we. Um, studied the financial aspects of running a commercial compost operation after the rental closes. We, we didn't really get down to sort of the nuts and bolts of, uh, you know, what would the tip fee be and how many people do we need, how much equipment do we need, what days would we need to be open. Um, there would need to be a whole analysis done there, and I think the board sick committee decided that, you know, it's just not really something that the, a service that the city needs to offer. 
Didn't but we get to do something for the business community, the small business community, when it's sort of a, an auxiliary to what we're doing for residents, like the letting small businesses bring their bag stuff here? I think that makes sense. But I think to set up a whole separate operation to continue to serve a commercial piece of the right. market is you know, not something that and, we're good at. And Saturday isn't a good day for them, really. You know, they, they need access during the week. And I, I would point out that, that Valerie Recycling isn't anywhere on the list because, you know, they don't have capability. They don't really have plans right now, but that's another um, thing that may change in the future. If there's the demand, then they may offer that service. How, um, how about the possibility of, and, and this is sort of building off of what Jim's saying, is that somebody may walk in to meet the demand of, um, some form of, of what, we, what we call a GOCO, government-owned, commercially operated entity, at, at the Glendale facility, um, where we continue to control the space, but we contract out the operation <coughs> of... Because what I'm thinking is if these guys sort of collectivize and come up with a management plan for something like that, you know, where they'd basically be using our scales. That's what I'm thinking, because that's the asset that, that I think anybody who wants to take this on is going to have to have. Or they could just go by cubic yards. Cubic yards. They, don't, they don't need the scale. Yeah, I don't know how they feel about that. I'm just thinking, you know, if I was if I was in landscaping, I would rather go by weight than cubic yards. But. <coughs> sure. I'm also intrigued by Karen's comment about that she more farms that run into the process, because for many years, and with my work with CISA, mm -hmm. farmers have always wanted to take certain kinds of, of uh, especially leaves, yeah. if they have, depending on what the nature of their work is. So we might, so sorry, um, we might find um, that um, the, um, uh, we might find the, uh, uh, sorry, this is, um, might find the farmers are. Uh, yes, right. That we might find that the farmers are, will step up, and even if it's not a viable go co or it has anything to do with, with um, money, it would um, it would re reflect a way to respond to the needs of the community. That we just have to wait. I, you know, that's changing over time, and um, I'm thinking. And actually, um, CISO is, is, is interested in working with us on this and talked about how we could get the Northeast Recycling Council to come down and do workshops and you know, we could really collaborate. And I think it, it is worth uh, continuing to pursue the farms. Or let them sort of work with that or, or not be right. shy about sharing the information about right. it just to see what might happen. Yeah, because it, it's a resource that totally. and it could for many of them, composting could become a, a, a new enterprise mm -hmm. that would help to diversify their operations. Yeah. I'm curious about that because of critical mass issues, but mm -hmm. we have to wait and see. Well, a lot of them are already composting or on farm materials. Yeah. Anyway, I do think that's another opportunity that could be. <coughs> and who knows, even the good folk things might change, but they do have. But you don't see a role for the Glendale World facility. Certainly not that would make sense for us. Yeah. It looks like ten or fifteen thousand dollars a year would be the income, which isn't. No, and and you know we're we're talking about being open Saturdays only, so we're not really serving the commercial need if that's if that's what we're talking yeah. about. One day a week. Would we allow them? dump on Saturdays if they wanted to? Mm. We could, right? I mean, there's no prohibition. Well, well we, um, actually, the, I, the way I understand it, you have to have a residential vehicle permit to have access to the program on Saturdays. But also so a commercial vehicle wouldn't qualify. But isn't that the program that we, I mean, we invented that program. Yep. So, 
if you, if you wanted to charge commercial customers coming in on Saturdays, that's that's up, up to you. But I mean, I think I think they should be charged. Mm -hmm. and but my, mm, yeah. but my yeah. thought is that if you if I were a commercial enterprise, one day a week is it going to help? No, me. no, and I don't want to go down it. that road. And so for us to to Plus, they don't want to, to undermine anybody who might be stepping into it as a commercial operation exactly. and take away part of them. I just wanted us to be clear because yeah. we do a lot of, or yeah. we're talking about opening up the, the trash recycling yeah. too. Right. But that's a very distinct measure right. of payment. Right. <coughs> Any other questions for Karen? Can you yeah, we had one of the one of the things we wanted to talk to the board about in terms of the Leaf and Airways Composting Program. We've been trying to establish the dates that the 18 dates that the facility would be open. And um, back when we were working with the uh, the board subcommittee on the residential uh, compost program, um, that subcommittee had settled on um, six weeks in the spring and fall <coughs> that the compost facility would be open. So. Uh, six weeks in the spring and fall, and then one Saturday per month during June, July, August, and September. And then we would take uh, two Saturdays in January to accept Christmas trees. And that, that ended up being 18, um, 18 dates. So um, we've asked Karen to come up with a schedule so that we can post it and get it around so people know when we're going to be open um, for residential composting. So she's worked out a couple of options here and I didn't really want to stray from what the board had directed us to do without talking to the board. So, so just so you know what these look like, this is this is what <coughs> was proposed in this option one is eight well it's seventeen. So Christmas trees, six weeks in the spring, one collection in July, August, September, and six in the fall. That's what that looks like. And then option two um, is basically the every other week throughout the, the whole growing season, so April to December. And this has, I believe it has some advantages over this. <coughs> Option three is, is um, what did I say? No, I'm, I'm sorry. These are the second, second and fourth of every month. And that's every other week. But July, August, September, just one collection. And then the option four is to have a, have reduced hours on Saturday. Instead of going from seven to four every Saturday that they're collecting at the back gate, it would be noon to four every Saturday between April 1st and December 1st. And um, I, I, after the postcard went out, I, I have gotten a lot of calls from residents who um, say, you know, they, they're, they're bringing their yard and leaf waste in their, in their vehicles and bags, and they make lots of trips, and they're saying, you know, this, this scenario just doesn't really work for them. They're mowing <coughs> their lawns and doing their gardens, you know, starting in April and throughout the summer. Um, some of them, which I don't really sympathize with too much, have grass clippings, and they say they really can't keep them for two weeks. And Is that them at my house? Yeah. <laughs> but those turn <coughs> possible pretty fast. So... So that was kind of leading to this to make it more regular and also more like in the pattern we're getting people saying. But the other thing that, that I started... People really bring their grass clippings and dispose of them? They do, actually. Wow. Yeah. But the, the main thing I was concerned about is when I asked the attendants, um, you know, we do open the back gate um, for a couple of Saturdays in the fall. And... You know, granted, we have six days a week collection going on all year round, but I found out that they, once they have six people or six cars down in the um, 
in the tent, they have to keep, they have to wait until somebody comes back up because there's just not enough maneuvering room and, you know, there's safety issues. The, the narrow, the road is kind of narrow and um, especially some of the elderly, you know, you just have to <coughs> make sure everybody's staying really calm and, the, and then the, with limited hours, um, people reportedly, you know, are kind of rushing to get another load in before the before the gate closes. So I'm a little concerned about the more you concentrate the um, the the hours, the more the traffic problems we're going to have. But and the other thing that they said is that you know if we're open from seven to four, people are doing their yard work in the morning. You know they're they're actually not really starting to come in until ten thirty, and. And in some cases, they they want things to dry up a little bit before they start, um, or they have other errands to do or whatever. So the later start um, seems to make sense also. And by also by spreading it out, what what I was proposing is that we would have um, an attendant at the gate and one down in the pit, directing traffic, making sure that nobody's dumping any plastic bags or whatever. But um, um, Except for the peak periods, which is like fall cleanup, um, I don't think that you'd need to have a heavy machinery operator there because, you know, they, the um, HMEL could come in sometime during the week, push everything back, get it ready for the next Saturday. It's HMEL. Oh, heavy <coughs> machinery. Equipment mm -hmm. operator. Mm -hmm. So, are you saying you like option four? I do. Mm -hmm. So do I. Because because it's easy to remember. Yeah, it's open every Saturday <laughs> between April first and December first. I was just going to ask what the staffing issues would be in the different comparisons. Well, in all of them, you need two attendants. Right. And these three, you need two. Well, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but but you would have two HMEOs because it would be concentrated activity. So you would, um, in theory, you would need to have two people there for safety reasons. Um, what would you say? I would say that we haven't fully vetted what the uh, staffing requirements would be, but I would think that they would be pretty comparable no matter what the hours were. But, uh, I actually hadn't talked to Matt about it yet, so I'm a little uncomfortable indicating what they would be, but um, I think the demands based on the time I'm not sure how they would have a huge impact on what the staffing requirements would be. <coughs> so, you know, basically, even even this one, it's going from 54 hours a week to four for yard and roof waste. In this one, it's, um, it's even more, I mean, the percentage of opportunity is much less for people, even though you have more out, you know, seven to four. The other issue besides staffing that I was concerned about is when I first looked at this, I thought, all right, how are we presenting this to the people? And again, someone else has already mentioned, and I just want to second that, that the fourth option makes it a very uh, e easy to communicate option. And if it, you want the public to use it or if it's for their benefit, yeah. it's we're going to get a lot more complaints when it's not as consistent as that. Right. Yeah. And um, the point was made that the you know we've done some outreach in the postcard and media where it says up to 18 Saturdays a month. Well, this is good news that we're being responsive to um, you know to what people have been expressing that 18 Saturdays doesn't mean. Mm -hmm. No, I like the simplicity of the option four. I think you're right. The people people won't remember this the week is this the time. Frame. And now we tried to do some you know patterns. So, Karen and Jim, do you need a motion th tonight? Um, to, is there a part of this that you need to move forward? Well, I, think Nick wants to say something. I think we need to have a little more staff discussion on this first, mm -hmm. especially if we're looking at option four. I'm concerned looking at this um, with 
adoption for that um, are we going to be able to find people every Saturday from 12 to 4 rather early morning number one number two is that means uh, moving the equipment from here up to there 17 times more every Saturday every other Saturday than we propose to do because the bucket loaders won't be staying up there they'll have to be down here they'll have to drive out from the DPW yard each time we open up so, so there's some, there's some more hidden would, costs here, and I'm yeah. concerned about the staffing level. Finding HMEOs from Saturday from you know, 12 to 4 in the afternoon might be difficult. Well, I, I'm proposing that they would come in on a flexible basis during the week to push everything up or around and stage it for the next week. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, they're going to be there on Saturday. Unless, and, uh, except for, you know, there is a peak beginning of um, November, you know, maybe into the third week of November, where, yes, you probably have to have some additional money. Right there. We've had the discussions. Did you want to, you didn't want to go too far without having the discussion with us? We've had the discussion. Uh, I think that's something that we can bring up to the next board meeting on the 10th of April. <coughs> yeah. Great. Okay. Karen, thank you. Great. Thanks, Karen. So I take your uh, uh. So all set, Jim? As far as yeah. I believe so. And Karen, were you here for another? Well, there's another public person here. Um, and is it, but you're here as a general, you're not here for a particular item on the agenda? Not on this agenda, no. Okay. But Com would you I like there to? there was a community part of this, so community yeah, forum. Yeah, public, public, public forum or something. I, I think we could probably do that now. Um, okay. Um, well, my name is Peter Racklebush, and I've been interested in recycling since 1975. I was one of the uh, Friends of Western Mass Recycling that got the MRF together, et cetera, et cetera. Whilst there, I uh, started a craft committee, which was creative recycling and production, because my interest is how do you divert a waste stream into a resource stream. I'd love to see the Department of Public Works become the Department of Public Resources, actually, which would be more in line with, I think, how things have to move forward these days. With the dump closing, um, there's going to be a whole lot more emphasis on trying to get the cost out of the handling of a waste stream, which is really only means it's actually valuable, because it's only waste if it's not being used, so it's getting trashed. And trash, to me, is like litter after a concert or something. So trash and garbage has to be manufactured. The reuse committee, which I joined only you know, six, eight months ago or something, um, has been looking for a building for, I think, 10 years now or something, for A, storage, and B, I would say, for being able to show the public what how it works. The simplest example is, um, as Karen pointed out in this morning's meeting, a compactor can get about 400 pounds of styrofoam into, a, into one block as opposed to a, um, having to handle it the way it is. So simply by buying a used compactor from somewhere um, would be a way of actually getting money for the styrofoam. All other part, there's many other parts in the waste stream which, if separated out, could become a resource. Unfortunately, on the other side of the range, they're going to single stream, which means that a lot of the product is now way further degraded. We were out um, in Bel in um, yeah Belchertown, National Fiber. Uh, showed us their plant, and we did a thing that hopefully will be on Northampton Community Television. Anyway, they had one pallet there of um, stuff from the, sing from the single stream, uh, and it was un totally unusable. I mean, it was, so, it was so mixed up with plastic and bottles, and all kinds of things were in this pallet load of uh, 
So that's exactly going backwards from what getting people used to sorting was all about. Um, in our town in Hatfield, I mean, the Boy Scouts get bottled, get cans and things, and there's plenty of community resources on how to um, how to basically separate out from what's now the waste stream into feedstock. Since there has been no building, we walked around a couple of months ago, and lo and behold, there's the trolley building. Now, I can't yet tell from the plans exactly where that trolley building is, and it's a cement building on... Um, I'm sure that it's easier to show. It's, it's that building on, uh, at the end with the communication tower above it. Now, it looks like crap at the moment, because unfortunately, the TPW has let it go that way meaning that the roof uh, is leaking and um, it definitely needs some, some uh, work. And I have from a contract, I can get one for Ned because we had talked about this. And MJ, you got one this morning. Yes. I think you want to get copies for folks. <coughs> because I talked with David Pomerantz, who I understood had done a survey and analysis of that building. Um, I don't know how long ago, but certainly not within the last six years, because he had no record anywhere at um, Central Services about what the cost would be. But MJ, you said it was going to—it was estimated at twenty-five to twenty-eight thousand to re, um, restore the building, re revive—I like that term now—revive the building. It would be probably much more expensive to knock that building down because it was way overbuilt to start with. There's a building in Sunderland that's similar. I went to um, Amherst Farmers Supply, who supplied the metal roof for that building. It's 130 feet long, and I think, <coughs> excuse me, 25 feet wide, and it was out one inch in alignment over that 130 feet. That building's the same. It is dead true, as far as the floor, the, the walls, etc. That, that building is structurally excellent. This build, yeah. I'm just, I'm a little fuzzy on exactly which building we're talking about. The, <coughs> one, the one down the hill? No, no. no. no, no it right, backs up where the metal recycling is. It's actually oh, right, the it's right here. It's yeah. tan. Okay. Sort of tan. You see it yeah. both sides. Okay. Um, <coughs> with, without an actual building to A, get storage for the collection of some of these materials, and also a way to show, for instance, I thought the first, when it opened, when it opens, there be all the plastics and the differentiation between the plastics. Because people have a much easier time, I found, when they can see what it is, what they're supposed to do. Reading something, even in the paper that's coming out on the 17th, it's much harder to go down a list. Um, but when community the community gets behind the, the, well, I understand the mayor is also very in favor of the, of the zero waste. I don't know how you folks feel about it, but that means like San Francisco is down to 80% recycling, is up to 80% recycling rather. And that's come about because of a major education effort that they've got to that. Now the numbers are somewhat fuzzy, people say it's not really 80%. I'm happy to go with net zero waste which means that you produce a certain amount that offsets what inevitably goes to the dump. I, I have two bags of garbage a year. I don't know what to do with those. Or, or, well, thanks to Karen, I'm now going to be able to get the hard plastic. So, by the way, I've been an antique dealer uh, for 35 years, so I've been in the recycling business for a long time. Basically. However, it would seemed to me a real slap to the idea of re reuse, to have a building that could really be reused over there, and then decide to knock it down, to make what I got was 12 parking spaces. Um, All right, so let, let me stop. That's a five minutes, and you present okay. a lot of, really a lot of stuff. great ideas. Um, so is it fair to say you're working with the committee and exploring some of these ideas? Well, the reuse committee, yes. Yes. Yes, that, I mean, they've been looking for 10 years, and here's a building right where the recycling effort at this facility is. So, so, so our, our job here is to 
set policy, review policy, um, kind of act as a, a citizen board to guide the department. Yep. And there's not much we can do with that much information this evening, but you're working talking to the staff. I mean, if, if this idea germinates, it, it will come back to us. But at this point, there's not much we can do this evening. No, 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 no. This is just, I'm just looking for support for this. And um, I did, I would like from Ned, if I could, to get the copy of that estimate for the, which came out at twenty-five to $28,000, because it's not at Central Services, and the figure was quoted. So I'd like to compare that. I don't know how many years ago. I assume it's more than six years. So could you work on some of that? And, and Jerry, can I offer some yes. yep. on That um, Peter has been involved with the reuse committee. There was some interest in trying to find some space on the DPW grounds here to be able to do some reuse. Yeah. We have looked at the building. Uh, we've had discussions with Jim. We were really sort of steered away from that because of the cost of rehabbing it. And... Also, I think other concerns about what's happening in terms of the redevelopment of the site in the back. We have, the committee has been offered the opportunity to try to, oh, think about a better way to use the existing footprint that we have and that we are, I think we're very focused on being able to do that once we get through some of the initial traffic studies. Right. And, um, Peter, it, I would say, does not speak for the whole committee, although they might be interested. I think that Peter feels... Uh, has been a, a particular advocate for the reuse of this particular building. And I think that the committee has looked at it a little bit. <coughs> well, I think there is interest in that. Um, I think that the most Im the most immediate effort is to try to get something up and running here in the, in this transitional time, and then to see whether or not, you know, how it works to get something small going, to see if it's got legs, and then you know, who knows what the rest of the site's going to look like in terms of our redevelopment of the site and the new DPW facility. So that's where it's been. I think the reuse committee has marched around quite a bit out there to take a look at the site. Jim? I actually don't want to say anything. Pardon me? I don't want to say anything. Okay. So uh, I, I would like to just say we have a small subcommittee that is looking at what we can do on a, a reusable small scale, and it will wait until we get through most of the transition and the, we have more information from the traffic study. Um, you know, so we're, we're, not, we're not in a rush. We're, okay. we're waiting for, until we have more information. Well, thank you for coming in. I, I, you've got to love the enthusiasm. I mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It really would be a shame <coughs> to knock that building down, you know, yeah. to make parking spaces because it's right where you want it to be. It's right there for what what you've designated. Well, I would encourage site. you to work work with the group. I, uh, we're not quite the the. I love, as I said, I love the enthusiasm. We're not quite the right group, and it's not at the right stage for us to really sink our teeth into it. Certainly not tonight. Yeah. No. Every, Jerry right. starts Thanks. with the <laughs> <laughs> single step. All right. Thanks for this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Peter. you. Uh, all right, so now we're back to uh, the bituminous concrete, FOB Palmer Pavian, the amount of $170,000. Second. This is our annual contract with uh, asphalt, that's so FOB bituminous concrete. It's a hundred thousand dollar contract. <clears throat> There's bids from um, Lane Construction out of Westfield with the round trip mileage. It was going to come to about one hundred ten dollars and thirty six cents a ton. Um, Warner Brothers was a twenty seven point nine mile round trip. Would have brought the price up to one hundred dollars, one hundred one dollars a ton. And with Palmer Paving out of East Hampton being uh, twelve miles total, it would be. Um, Eighty-nine dollars and change a ton. So last year was seventy-nine a ton. This year it's seventy-eight a ton. And like I said, the mile is just the calculator we use to try to figure out uh, the cost effectiveness of doing a trip so far away with hot asphalt and bringing it back. So it kind of weeds uh, prospective low bidders out. Like uh, lane construction came in at seventy-two a ton. When you take in their mileage, it costs uh, twenty dollars more a ton just to get it back here. 
Name the fulfilling potholes. Any discussion or questions? All in favor of approving the contract for bituminous concrete? Aye. 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 Uh, next, a contract for zinc orthophosphate to Shannon Chemical in the amount of $29,000. Second. This is for a co corrosion control facility on Route 9. Uh, this is an annual contract. We had three bidders this year. One was no bid. The other two came within 0 .0028 cents per gallon between the two bids. Uh, total bid difference of $11.20 between the two. <laughs> so very competitive bidding on this one. Questions? All in favor of approving the contract for orthophosphate? Aye. Uh, next, a change, <coughs> proposed change in the street musician permit policy. We were asked to go to a meeting, we being uh, BJ and I, to go to a meeting uh, downtown uh, to discuss a number of issues that the business owners are having downtown with street musicians and other activities taking place. <coughs> On that committee meeting, um, we have a handout tonight of basically how many permits that we've issued in the past five years. Uh, being street musicians or street performers. And then a lively discussion between uh, police, the bid, some business owners, the mayor, and myself, as to looking at changes they discussed that we could do in our permitting system. Uh, and those are bolded down below this uh, first memorandum that you see. The biggest issue that came out was a particular musician who tends to park himself in front of Thorns Market on a daily basis, and he honors the two-hour rule. He'll move down for 15 or 20 minutes, then he comes back up for another two-hour event. And I you would know, really like if the board would change the policy, though, that he continues to move on and never come back to the same place in a given day again. So there's a thought a process here about doing that. There was a a discussion about increasing the fees. Obviously, we can't increase the fees um, above and beyond what our cost to actually do the paperwork, store the records, and manage the system. So when you look at that, it really is $25 for a permit. Our discussion was, well, why don't we do it as a quarterly permit? So that would be taken up four times a year. That was discussion through the bid also uh, with a student discount. Uh, there was concern about local students trying to play downtown and not being able to afford a, a quarterly fee of $25 every quarter versus some of the more professional musicians that are down there and uh, could maybe do that. Um, we have no penalties for not following the, the permit rules. Uh, that's a bigger discussion that needs to be done through city ordinances for fines. And um, like I said, it's, it was a, there was a number of things they discussed, but the biggest issue they have is the uh, street musicians at the moment and the panhandlers. But that's nothing that DPW takes care of on the panhandling side. Do you still have a panhandling permit? No. So are you um, making any recommendations, or these are your, your recommendations? Well, these are recommendations or discussions that came out of that group meeting. Um, I think the first one is quite easy to address is that we... Um, look at our existing permit, which you have a copy in front of you tonight. If you turn on the second page, this is the permit here, page 2, item 5, that we already had to say, state the fact that after two hours, the front of you must move 100 feet from the previous location, but it doesn't say for how long. So I think there's a time frame issue that we can put on. Missing something? Um, there's a time frame issue that we could put out that he can't return to the same vicinity on any given day. That keeps forcing him down the street, or up the street for that matter. So he's not <clears throat> coming back and staying in front of a particular business for 90% of the day, which is the biggest concern that I heard down there on this meeting. I think that would rectify that. It wouldn't take care, you know, away from the person's ability to work the streets for money, um, as far as a uh, musician goes. It just changes his venue every two hours. Just a question. Is the 50 feet a uh, workable number? It's 100 feet in the permit, under item 5. The 50 feet between street musicians, that's been okay. They have and the wrong one. They have performers. Yeah, we're trying to yeah. 
Um, I think I had I had some extra copies, and so some are performers and some are musicians. Oh, I have. Sorry. Okay, I was like, yeah, musician. Yeah. But I get it. Yeah. 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 Ye
and 59 was too many, then it's got to be less than 59. Certainly, 68, 70, 74 would be too many, and 59 was too many, right? So, is that, that was one of the things? I didn't hear a complaint that there was too many musicians downtown. Oh, okay. I didn't hear that at all. Oh, it's just the first bullet, limiting the number of permits issued during the calendar year. Is that to one specific performer? I think that position? would be, I think that would take away from the flavor of downtown. If I, I, yeah, oh, yeah, I kind of think you're right. I don't like that. The people that are downtown, if they're not making any money because they're not that good, they're not going to stay down there very long. <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> 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 well, those were How just about? some of the things that were thrown around. Okay. Okay. How about if we take Gary's concept and say, um, well, that was that seemed like a very obvious one. I know, but yeah. just, it, it's just one one idea. It particularly corrects the issue that was part of the discussion that that Ned and, and um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> welcome back. Jet lag. Um, jet lag. Jet lag. Um, that is true. Um, that. Um, that they related to, but then um, when we issue permits, is that during one month or is it, um, I forgot how we do that. Calendar year. Uh, right, but I mean it's like any time in the, in, that people can come in. Any time, so, yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, some, some way to project the fact that this is how we need one, that this is as of June 1st, this is the direction that we're going to go for this, something like that. Yeah. Uh, just a quick comment, the fact that we only have currently 17 permits out there, it would be fairly easy to connect with 17 people, versus if all of a sudden we have by June 1st, we have 100 or 70 yeah. or whatever it is, it might be more difficult to reach out to get to everyone, too. How about if all right, so there's some consensus that the two-hour adjustment would be palatable. Could you come back to us with a, you know, think about the wording and sure. instead of do us that. doing it? I think Gary's change is fine. Yeah, just per day. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. bullet number two. Yeah. 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 So would you like I'm to make sorry, a bullet number three. Limiting the street uses musician permits to two hours at one location per day, which does not allow them to come back. The same location on the same day. Right, and he can move 100 feet down yeah. street, up right. street. And I, yeah, I he just can't move 100 back. feet back after he's after he's moved the first 100 feet. He has to keep right moving. Right. And that's what's happening now. He's just moving back. So say it, say it again. Yeah. Well, it's it's bullet number three. The permit is not located within 50 you, feet of any other street. You're probably looking at bullet number five on yours. Yeah. If you get the musician permit. Versus the performance. No, right. I'm looking at this thing, and it is, it's number three. It is. Oh, oh yeah, I'm not. No, it's no but you're right, on this uh, number five. So basically, yeah. but it'll include that second line there. But well, this is really, what I'm saying, this is what it says on the restrictions. This is the street musician's permit. It's restriction number five. So it's add the words per day. And that's all. After, the, after that sentence. That's part of that sentence. And I also think that's fair. There are... If if a location is most lucrative, then it should be shared among different mm -hmm. providers. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I'm not sure it's crystal clear, but but if, if the staff makes a modification and brings it back, we can sure we can do that. Uh, a representative of the North Street Association would like to make a comment. Well, uh, it's kind of a question. So you're changing this now, so it'll say per day, but I think that. PJ was alluding to the fact that there's no ordinance in place so that there's nothing to enforce it if a person does go back to. So wh what happens now? Does, does the Board of Public Works recommend a change to an ordinance or has it got to start with the City Council? How, what's the process on that? That was just one of the ideas that the group had was creating actual ordinances. So would it start in the ordinance committee? Would it start at City Council? Would the Board of Public Works recommend? Like, how does how does an ordinance, what, what causes I'm just curious of the creation of that. It could come from the police department. It could come from the Board of Public Works. It could come from a, a counselor. It could come from almost anywhere. Depends who wants to support it and move it through. The other thing, I don't know if you have the ordinance, but permit, print number 12 says that any 
you know, basically violation of these conditions could lead to the immediate revocation of the on site by, I'm guessing, a police officer. Okay. So yeah, I, I was just curious sort of, about that. Yeah, there's already sort of something in place. I think I think the additional ordinance would be if we were going to do fines. Oh, I but see. But as far as revoking the permit, that's already here. I see. Okay. Yeah, the the ordinance is definitely related to being able to find someone for not being in compliance. Right. And that's currently not in the ordinances. Thank you. Well, I so was that a motion, uh, or are you contemplating a motion? No, they're going to bring no, language back. Yeah. Back. yeah. Oh, they are. Okay. We're bring language back like on it. the April tenth meeting to you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Terrific. Putting Chris to sleep. So. No. <laughs> Good. All right, uh, so we're good on that. Next, we're going to set a date for a claims committee meeting. We've got a couple of uh, claims. The next meeting. All right, give me my calendar. Uh, it will be April 10th. Do you want to come in and fly? Yeah. Okay. All right, so BJ will come in and do. Both are those two 15 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so 5 and 5 15. Uh, private ways. Private ways, um, there's a draft in your pack that was left out on the table tonight about a letter going out to the. Uh, a butters to the public ways that the board said no, we do not recommend. That came out of one of our last meetings, so I wanted to get your uh, uh, approval of that letter so that we can get these mailed out uh, to those abutters for uh, center court and to uh, what was the other one we had? Um, Bradford Street South in the last meeting. Are you accepting punctuation? Of course, I'm accepting everything. Uh, in the first sentence of the second paragraph, I would say we made a formal recommendation to the city council that they not. I would change two to that day. And I put a comma after city street and before the parenthetical. Comment at the end of the sentence. Mm -hmm. And then philosophically, my other question when I saw this earlier was just a question of how forcefully to make the point that uh, they should talk to a city councilor if they're not happy. Do you think it should be more forceful? No, I think it's plenty. I wonder even if it's too much. I mean... And do we want to specifically advise them that we will not be calling? Yes, I think we should. Yeah. Um, I would actually go a little further than that. I would say it is it is our intention, um, pending the completion of the city's review of all private ways, because I think we already have in place what we did this year, which is. We're not going to chop some people off because they were further up in the process than than somebody else that they were on the shorter list, and that the mayor basically said that was the reason that the mayor said we would move forward plowing this year. And I I, I could see that happening again next year. You mean if we, if we don't make it through the whole? We don't thing. make it through the whole list. If there's even one left outstanding, and, and ultimately the city council has the final say on our recommendation. That's, so yeah. until yeah. they say. Yes, we agree. But, but Terry's raised the point on several occasions that the cash is not there. And I could easily see that the city does not get through this list this year. But there's also the discussion that we continue to move forward and put it on the ballot question. Good point. So in our motions for those streets that we deem to not meet minimum standards to become a city street, I think there's language in that motion that, that henceforward we will not plow it. That's correct. Okay. So we, we've actually enough. voted to stop plowing the streets that didn't make that time. I'm wondering where that leaves the city. Because 
like my understanding was there was some concern that there might be a liability issue on that. Had anybody else heard that? Liability in what way? That's not, yeah, that's what I'm going to weigh on. That, that this idea that there was going to be um, some, some win and some lose in a given year might open us to, to litigation. Read the statute. I think it. I think that the original statute is what governs this situation. It's not us. It's the state. We're, yeah, we're trying to follow the regulation and the statute. It's not the merits of what we're doing. We're just implementing the, the state decision. Right. I understand. Uh, and I think what you're expressing is what other people the perception from some people thinking that we can't do that. Safety issue or whatever. So. All right, and we're we're moving through the list. Uh, we have our certified mails ready to go out um, to the next six candidate streets for I think it's April twenty seventh, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. So that will be going out pretty quickly. Where are you going? Manchester. So we continue to move forward. We we we're fully planning to get through these streets as we told the mayor that we would in a timely fashion and that's what we're pushing for. Yeah, we'll certainly at least get to the point where we have made our determination as to whether to recommend that the city council accept the street. And perhaps you can give us an update on the surveys for the first four streets. Um, they're actually going to be doing the field work starting next week. They've done deed research to date so far. The other street that we moved up was Bradford Street due to the sewer line interceptor project ongoing. Mm -hmm. And that will actually be paid out of the sewer enterprise funds instead of this <clears throat> $24,000 appropriation. So this is really poor is for the sewer interceptor. So we can move that one forward also. And the legal work would follow the survey work? Mm -hmm. yep. So hopefully in the next... <clears throat> Three weeks or so to a month, we'll actually start seeing some preliminary survey plans of what uh, these four particular ways, which was um, Strawberry Hill, uh, Edward Square, Church Street, Isabella Street. The first four we were tackling with the surveyor, and then now Bradford Street, Extension, and North. Does Laura Hansen or perhaps the city engineer go out initially and... I mean, there's, there are gray areas in all of these. You know, how, what, what, how, how much easement should there be as a right-of-way for machinery? So the survey work's going to go out there. They're going to pick up the initial you know, pavement with things of that nature, just see what this thing looks like. And then what we don't know is, you know, like back to Street North, are the properties out there in, in the registry of deeds bounded like there is some kind of way in there? Or is there nothing out there? That's what we don't know offhand. So you, you'll, or you and Laura will make some determination once you've got accurate survey? I'll make that. I'll be doing that. Some okay. Of it, yeah, some of it has to be made up. Right. I think that's, that's and the exactly point, and right. the time to do that would be after the, the initial survey? Right. Once they get existing conditions, they do the re deep research, they get everything on the plan, and if there's no way out to the street, then you need to determine what's going to fit with what we have. We're going around on Bradford okay. Street. People were concerned. Actually, people were concerned on a number of streets. What's the way, what's the right of way going to look like? Run it through my living room, or is it... Just, know, just clipping the front porch in half. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We, we don't know. Four okay. So the, 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 the proper sequence would be first the preliminary survey. Field visit, see what works, what doesn't work. Is it going to be 25 feet? Is it going to be 28 feet? Is it going to be 30 feet? I mean, what kind of encroachments does it have on personal property? And then they go back, at, so they'll do some field work, work with you, and then go back and pin it, or? Well, we've a plan would come forth that we bring to the Board of Public Works for your approval, and then it can go to City Council for approval, and then we can pin and bound it at a later point if we care to. Uh, oh, so the, plan not necessary. Will, the plan will probably say uh, bound to be set or pin to be set and at a future time that can be. The survey, though, would be accurate enough that that could be done at any time or never. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So we, we're, we're making progress. So I can give this to you all electronically if you want. You can make comments and edits to give it back. I can put together as a collective letter, and then we can discuss it at the next board meeting, and that way we can get this out. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, Stormwater and Flood Control Task Force. Uh, where to begin? Um, we went we went significantly off the path last week, and a lot of the discussion centered around um, what exactly um, we were going to be paying for, what the budget was going to be. Um, one of the issues that was raised was the timeline, as far as Paul saw it, was he wanted to get some recommendations on, on how we would structure um, fees and, and whatever by whatever our recommendations were going to be by May 1. And there was a general consensus that that's completely unworkable. <coughs> um, then we spent a lot of time talking about um, this idea of what the proposed budget was actually going to look like. because. There was there's a there's a there's a strong feeling on the board that it's impossible to build a fee and rate structure without knowing what the budget is that you're supporting, and there was a, you're going to have to step in with me on this one. There were some questions about whether you know the two million dollar figure that we had reported to them um, was reasonable and appropriate, um, and where the cutoff ought to be as to how far. Uh, we ought to be funding things beyond what was absolutely required by either the Army Corps of Engineers or the state or ETA. Is that about right? Mm -hmm. No resolution, and um, there are there are some there are some strongly <coughs> held positions in that room, and I don't know how we're going to come to a consensus on some of these things. The other theory is that you, you create a rate structure and you build towards it and you bank some cash and you do the projects as they come up. There's, all, there's some resistance to that, particularly given um, you know concerns about other other taxes and fees that the city is. There's this idea that there's going to be. I mean, there's 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 a lot of support or in, in 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 one area for relying on overrides. And Jim has you know made the point on a number of occasions that we're not going to vote for overrides. Um, but there are people who are mired in that in that, in that that mindset, and I don't know how we're going to move. It's hard enough to do it for the school system that everybody right. loves, right. but stormwater is not going to happen. I agree, and my feeling is that there has to be an enterprise component to it, because if we're going to do this out of general funds, we're not going to capture a huge source of revenue, which are the, you know, the... Uh, the people who don't pay property taxes, who are who are in many ways some of the largest contributors to the problem. Mm -hmm. um, I have not heard Smith College's public Smith Smith College's um, physical plant is represented on that, and that guy hasn't said anything yet. I'm <coughs> waiting to hear what he's going to say. I think he acknowledges that they're they're going to have to pay, but he's sort of watching to see the, which way the wind is blowing before he. He's he's the right guy at Smith. Do you know John? Yeah. He's the right guy at Smith to I think to speak uh, to what their concerns are going to be, but he hasn't said anything yet. So there's, he, there's no stormwater issue at Smith. It just goes to this pond that we have. And right. It's fine. <laughs> right. Well, um, Bob Reckman made an interesting observation on uh, and uh, on uh, one of the early meetings, which is. How are we going to pay for the stuff that the city owns? Who's going to pay for that? And his feeling is, is that we're all going to have to pay for that. And then we're going to pay for that which we contribute to the problem. So, for instance, there's going to be, uh, it's almost, almost a two-payment plan. And I, I, I don't think we've gotten so far as, as to be in that thinking, but I like, this, I like this construction, which was everybody is responsible for contributing to the common good kind of thing. And that, and then after that, it would be sort of a user-based thing. So you, 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 there's like, the, there's like the, the ante, and then the bass. <laughs> you know, I, think the, I think the task force needs to be careful about equity and how the system is set up, yeah. um, because some of these concepts that um, that Bob Reckman has, has put out in terms of everyone, you know, the like the take the impervious surface of the roadways. 
split it up universally and make everybody pay one little share equally across that. But when you start to crunch the numbers, what it does is it takes away some, some of the equity that you introduce by looking at impervious area calculations. So if you have a large impervious area, you pay more. But if you take all the roads in the city and divide it, what ends up happening is you take a very large chunk of the revenue needs and it makes it a large portion of what your bill is. So it changes, the equity isn't what you think it would be at face value. So the devil's, in the, the devil's in the details a little bit with this, and I think um, the task force is going to need to get into that level of detail to fully understand the, what the policy means in terms of implementation and what the bills are going to be. Um, but it's good. You know, I'm glad Bob is really thinking ahead. He's been sending me a lot of email, getting information and doing things. So you know, people on the task force have been putting in you know, good effort on it. So. Yeah, I'm happy with that. and you're right. I mean, that portion of it is progressive, and that, that's going to be an equity issue. Um, but there's this, I, 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 I hold to this idea that there is a common good component of this, and how we're going to address that, I haven't yet figured out. Um, and then you and I have to talk about something else. <laughs> so we really do have to have one. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that? Um, I mean, I, I came out of that. I have to say, I came out of that meeting really shaking my head about our ability to get to get to get to a meeting on the minds. The on this. biggest problem that I see is that um, there was a lot of confusion in the task force in terms of uh, it started with a discussion about what the deadline was for their charge, which was sort of a, kind of nebulous. Um, and then when Paul Spector had set a May first deadline. I think everyone had a heart attack saying, well, there's no way we can accomplish this. So one of the biggest things, I think, for, for the task force to realize is that what the deadlines are from the regulators in terms of the things that the city is obligated to do, what those costs are, and then our ability to pay for them, even if even if there isn't a utility that goes, because there's sort of a, there's a city schedule to do a new utility if they decide they want to do that, and it backs up from an October deadline when they need to decide whether they want to do it or not because it uh, has implications on the tax rate and they're required by the state law to make a, make a decision. So I've been working on a schedule where if you work back from the October date, well, how does it work, right? You've got uh, you've got uh, city council going on an ordinance, you've got um, city, city council, ordinance committee, ed lieu, finance committee, whatever their subcommittees are, and then you have the first, uh, the first city council meeting where they refer that to the subcommittees and then you work back to the joint committee and then you work back to the task force recommendation and you work back and you're like you're like last year somewhere is where we need to be right to get the thing done so what I've been trying to do is to put all these dates in a schedule so people can look at them because there's just a lot of confusion in terms of you know what do we have for deadlines can we reasonably get it done and then the other thing that I've started to think about which I'm you know I'm hopeful that if the task force can focus on the things they need to do, the October deadline is real. But there's always the contingency of, well, what if what if things aren't, what if an ordinance isn't approved by October? Then what do you do then? I mean, you have the city has obligations. Um, where does the money come from? What are the things that absolutely need to have to get done? You know, so there's a whole list of contingencies that the city needs to be thinking about if they can't get this work done and that, you know, between now and October. So, you know, there's a lot of serious things, I think, that, that uh, the task force and the mayor and everybody else needs to be thinking about in terms of how this thing is going to be implemented. And if it doesn't work, then what do you what do you do next? I mean, if you have to take another fiscal year to get the enterprise fund into into play and get an ordinance passed, then what do you do between now and, and that time? So there really are a lot of questions, and the more you think about them in detail, you know, there's, there's sort of a, they just roll out. I mean, there's a million questions, and this task force needs to get beyond the basic questions that they were asking the last time, which is, well, why are we doing this? And is the two million really a number? Is it maybe the EPA is joking, or maybe flood control is fine? Or, and it was a lot of uh, sort of unfocused discussion, which you know, it's it's fine, but you have to get beyond that and, and accomplish something. And there was a lot of ideology there. I mean, you know, one of the one of the issues that was raised is there are going to be 150 cities in town in in the state that have to deal with this. Why do we have to be one of the first ones? Why can't we let other people march down this road and learn from their experiences? Which I just, I, I don't know how to beat that argument back, um, but it's going to have to be addressed. But haven't there already been some cities in Massachusetts that have adopted this? Yes, a half yeah. a dozen. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what the point was 
is, why do we have to be seven? Why can't we be 70? And, you know... But isn't there a hammer that could come down on us if we don't respond to the well, issues? Well, every community's challenges are unique. And that's why we would be seven and <coughs> not 57. Right. If you took flood control out of the equation and you wanted to limp by with some stormwater basic compliance with an EPA permit, you might be able to find a way to bury it in the general fund. And that's what a lot of communities have done. But when you have a large, you have know, like a combined sewer overflow problem like Chicopee, or you have uh, flood control issues like Northampton, these start to expand the nature of the problem where you have to start looking at things like an enterprise fund or utility in order to pay for them because you can't take those large chunks and all of a sudden find a way to get them in the general fund and, and take care of them. That's why we would be seven. Yeah. Or, and, and not somewhere in the middle of the pack because the city has obligations and there really are only a few ways to take care of them. i got to get better at saying that because I'm going to have to say it a lot of times. Well, maybe it's rolling the tape for me. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there are about 350 communities in Massachusetts and maybe a dozen have levies. We're, it's that combination with the levies right. that puts us in a special, unique position. Keep feeding me lines. Okay. <laughs> and both of the other communities that have, their, you know, two of the others that have done it also have levies. Uh -huh. Chickabee and Westfield. So, all in all, it was a, it was a, it was a long and somewhat painful evening. I thought. <laughs> okay. Water restriction policy. It's almost that time of year. It is. Uh, so board, some board members may recall. So I handed out a little thing tonight uh, to each of you on this. Um, the implementation of water restrictions within the city is um, a requirement of our water management act permit, which uh, is issued by DEP that allows us to withdraw water and use it for public water supply. So. Um, there are two tables within the Water Management Act permit that, were, that have different stipulations for water restrictions. And the table that applies to the city in any given year is based on what our per capita usage was in the previous calendar year. So if, you, if the per capita usage is above 65 gallons per capita per day, you fall into one table. If it's over 65, then you fall into another table. Well, we went from one, we flopped from one table to another because our per capita uh, usage dropped from above 65 to below. So it's a kind of a modest um, change in the policy, but it has an impact on how we implement the restriction. And basically it's on, the language is confusing. I was, I kept reading it, but uh, it comes from the permit. Um, and it's on, the, the important language is on page three um, under that bullet about three quarters of the way down. So the way the, the current policy reads is that non-essential outdoor water use allowed one day per week before nine and after five. So before nine and after five, one day per week, you can water your lawn or do wash your car or whatever, whatever it is. Um, so the new language, which uh, is is shown in the handout that I provided earlier is that no non-essential outdoor water use between nine and after five. Um, so it's it's a ne it's it's written as a negative, but it, it basically makes the water restriction uh, less restrictive. Basically, is what it does. So. With a double uh, negative. With a double negative. Okay. So I can make that. Maybe I should make it clear because we, we need we basically need the board to approve the change in the policy, and we don't need it today. You know we, we'll need it later this year. But um, I can take the double negative out of there and maybe make it a little better. I just took it from the permit. No, it's fine. <coughs> so because if, if you say essential water use, you, you can't. It's hard to take it out. I think. It, it is because the non-essential is, is defined in the permit, so yeah. it's all stipulated on that definition. It's definitely regulatory ease. But basically, well, instead of one day, we can do it any day. Yes. You just can't do it Between during daylight. Yes, exactly. All right. And we have to do this every year? 
Okay. I'm hoping that we won't have to change every year. We have to, this is the third time we've changed it, but yeah. uh, our per capita use is down about it's down to about fifty uh, gallons per capita per day, which is really really great. That's yeah. fantastic. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with the meter replacement program that oh. we do, uh, more accuracy and, and reading and, and reporting. So. Stop, stop the flushing. Yeah, and water restrictions. So if you want... <coughs> a motion to approve the changes as distributed tonight would be awesome. Sweet. Sweet. So oh. the two changes are, are on page one. There was a big change on page two also. Yeah, uh, I can. Well, it's pretty self explanatory. I just tried to make that language clear. It refers to the two tables and right. it's the um, per capita usage that triggers it. I move that we approve the water restriction policy changes that Jim has drafted. I second. second. Any further discussion? All in favor of approving the changes? Aye. Aye. I'd like the record to show for BJ that this item, which was identified as a 15-minute item on the agenda, was taken care of in about four. <laughs> okay. So, do we know this? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, and uh, the final uh, final item. Jim, you're up again, Pulaski Park. I am, and uh, I wish I had better news, but I don't. Um, I think this grant is going... Nowhere. Oh, oh. Um, I attended the public, uh, the, the last meeting of the CPC was a couple of weeks ago when I went to that, and um, no one really turned out. I had somewhere in the order of 30 support letters from people and organizations within the community that were uh, uh, very supportive of the grant. Uh, so lots of support in writing, but nobody turned out really to um, present their support in, in, uh, in person. And the people that did it, well, Bob Reckman showed up, appreciate it. He came out and, and said some good things. Um, but uh, a couple of other folks were there, and uh, people were very down on the project because of the cost. And there seemed to me, either I wrote a really poor grant, and maybe part of it, I don't know, I'll take some of the blame for it if it doesn't go, but um, the CPC seemed really to be struggling with the concept of what the project was going to be in terms of uh, uh, picking up where the board had left off, I think the Stimson proposal was clear in describing that there would be more um, public charrettes and input to, to get more input into the design, to take the, all, the, all the work that the board had done a couple, of, three, four years ago, take that into account as they work out a new design. So the design wasn't their design competition design, but one that would evolve from that based on additional input. I thought it was pretty clear in the grant that that was sort of how the process would be, but um, based on the comments of the committee when they went around and started offering their opinion about the application. Clearly lots of confusion about, you know, what exactly is it? Why is this firm from Cambridge? Why did we pick them? And I spent a lot of time trying to describe that in the grant, but clearly, you know, the, the, the point didn't get across. And then the last thing is, um, you know, just the cost. It's about a million and a half dollar project to, to rebuild that park. And, um, you know, Stimson's number was 1.5. Nancy Denick's number was also about 1.5 or 1.7. So you have two different companies that have a lot of experience in this type of public park and you're coming up with a number that's about a million and a half. And I, you know, we, we reviewed the estimates. We think that they're real and, and pretty accurate. So, um, but that's not to say that it's a lot of money and there was a disconnect. People just thought on the committee that it was really just exorbitant giving the you know, the crisis for the city budget, and should we spend, you know, this amount of money on the park, and so, um, you know, general comments that, oh, sure, it would be nice, the park's kind of run down, but um, lots of concern about cost and confusion about process. So, um, they're going to be making their decision next Wednesday. I'm actually not that helpful with it. I don't think it'll be funded um, based on what we've done so far. You worked hard on that. That's it. Full
was my announcement I was going to make in the earlier part of the evening was that I take fully blame. I forgot to put it on the agenda that we were going to set rates tonight, even though I kept harping the fact that we had to have a budget passed on the 27th. So it's completely my fault. Um, I apologize to the board for that. I know you all worked hard over a number of mornings with me on that budget. Um, on this, I talked to Susan Wright, the business director, and as long as we don't have changes in what we're intending to do with the budget and percentages and so on, uh, so you can wait until your next board meeting, April 10th, or if you want to have a special board meeting earlier to set the rates and finalize the budget, that's fine too. That's your call. But I do want to apologize to the board. I was accepted. I mean, I, to me, that uh, it's, uh, I don't, I, I'm neutral, let's put it that way. So I, I, uh, I'm I, fine waiting until I see, I'll see how it's going to cause any problems. I think the only gray area that's out there is whether or not we do some partial bonding, partial funding from free cash, the sewer interceptor project is the only gray question left out there. And we got emails on that, right? Today. <coughs> yes, and subsequent to that, Jim tells me that the cost of that may not even be as high as we had thought. Yeah, yeah. $700 is what we made. Yeah. So if we're all, that's the really the only loose end, and if we're comfortable with that, and you reached well, out to everybody on that, right? Um, I didn't talk to David. Well, it makes sense to me. Okay. Take yeah. cash, especially. Yeah. 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 No. Did anyone see um, the presentation that Terry gave to the city council? And Dad was there. Jim was there. Yeah. I personally thought it was well received by the counselors. I did too. I, I sent him a, an email saying, "Great, good job." I mean, I, it was um, you know, it was 50 minutes long. I, I watched the whole thing. I was sort of riveted you know, <laughs> watching the reaction and kind of questions. And Terry let the counselors keep asking questions. He was open to that. And there were a few times, maybe more than several times, he sort of said, "Well, before I try to answer that, I think it's just let me." finish, I'll get to it, and, and you know, sort of, the answer was so complete when you did that, it just was great, and in the end they were, um, standing ovation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really, really wow. great, very, very much, I, mean, I, I you don't see that a lot in those great. city council meetings, and, uh, so it was really good to see it. They seem to really understand not only the specific budget, but the nuances and the reasoning for a lot of the stuff that's, you know, past rate hikes and why, and really seem to understand building up the undesignated balance um, fund balance so that we could implement projects up to a certain size of a million dollars and it, right. it makes an awful lot of sense to me and it seems like it really came across well to them. Yeah, two counselors sent me thank you, thank you notes. Yeah. That's great. I thought it was a really good, good job. Um, okay. I was accosted on the, on the Tarmac on Saturday morning by a gentleman I did not know who was very upset by the proposed increases of 50% in the blue bags, and I didn't. <laughs> he caught me off guard. I didn't have the I didn't have the gumption to tell him I'm a member of the board of public works and, and this is something we got to do. <laughs> the first thing Saturday morning, I was like, oh crap. So I got to start. I got to start walking around with a pocket full of talking points because. <laughs> Tell him to rush in and buy his next year's supply oh, before April 15th. We've 15. had a run on that. <laughs> Have we? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> they sell Sometimes easily. 40 and $50 worth. Wow. wow. That's am amazing. I have to confess, I doubled, it doubled my my purchase last week. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get rid of it. I'm going to just hoard my trash right till the garage is packed. <laughs> uh, the only thing I, other thing I have tonight is the. Uh, public comment that came out. We have to come up with some formal rules, policies for the board and subcommittees, what we want to do for public comment going forward. Um, my first thought is that we start at the beginning of the meeting, set aside five or ten minutes for it, and our regular meeting would start at the five or ten minutes, whatever we set it to, like City Council does, but the board needs to discuss, discuss what you want to limit it to. Is there a discussion back and forth? That's up to you, but so you'll put that on our agenda for next week? Yes, I mean, it has to be done as effective March 25th, so I will put a public comment session on the next board meeting, but 
I think the first thing on it, you need to control what it's going to be and look at the first time. Uh, the other thing is uh, National Public Works Week is coming up starting May 19th. Saw that. The yeah. poster behind Terry, uh, hot off the press. I, I want to know what it is about the tax base in that community that allows them to put a subway in a downtown that has one four-story building and one three-story building. <laughs> I want to know how they afford that public works building there. That's, that's what I want to know. That's wow. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. I was thinking of putting the second, second and third floor yeah. rental units. <laughs> <laughs> So it's an it's a interesting poster. I haven't read the history behind of how it got formed, but maybe next week or next meeting I'll have that for you. Mm. So one of these posters will be down at City uh, City Hall. There'll be one here. There's one next door for staff also. That's all I have. Okay, Jeff. The only thing I'm going to do is call your attention to this insert that came in the Gazette last week and it's also printed as an ad today. And it says all the great things that we do with taxpayers money and specific to our taxpayers. So I thought it was wonderful. Great. At first I thought we, it was uh, the League, Northampton League of Women Voters and Good Government, or GovernmentIsGood.com. And it, I just thought it was really well done. And I catch it. It's it, as a print ad in today's Gazette. This came as an insert, I think, last Friday or Saturday. We were contacted a few months ago by Professor Doug Amy at Mount Holyoke, um, who's behind, I think, the Government is Good he is, yeah. program. And uh, he was, some of the stats are public works related in there, the amount of clean water we produce, and some of those things came from, came from us. And there's a great quote from uh, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. He says, I like paying taxes, with them I buy civilization. And did you hear what you came to hear? Yes, I did. Thank you. I'm just that issue of private ways. I know that it was a planning board meeting, and, and I don't know. I've seen Jim so many times in the past couple of weeks. I was there for that CPC meeting, and I could tell as soon as I heard $200,000 for a design study that they thought they had already been that already had been done, I think some I saw I could actually feel something go click, and it was no matter what Jim said after that, it was going to be very difficult. But the others that came through with Service Net and who was the other one? Forbes Library. Well, the library got hammered last time. But <laughs> side story. Uh, the support I think when they they have the support of people there. It was more effective. Oh, as opposed to letters. Yeah. Uh, but the private way, I get confused <coughs> on that planning board because they had huge discussion about the private way. And I, and they mentioned that, you know, that DPW, BPW had, had, had made decisions on what not to accept. As they were not going to take on the, the private ways for, and I didn't know what those, that's part of the reason I came and wanted to hear it today. Uh, they had a day, I don't even know where they fit in the process. Um, because it seems to me that when you got money involved, that, well, that has the more, that more overarching, you know, factor in things. Whereas at the planning board, it's more philosophical. It was, I mean, they had people there from center court who had been, you know, two people. It's by ordinance that it goes to the planning board and the board of public works for a reference or recommendation. Yeah, I, I couldn't understand why they couldn't. They wanted. They had a long discussion of whether to, to discuss every single street or to, you know, accept it as or discuss them as a whole and reckon them. I don't think they came out with any recommendations. So we've That's been to every to street that we've on voted on tours. sometimes more than once. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole, all of us. So we, there's a few of us who've been there several times. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can't, I, I can't say it. I don't. I didn't get the impression that the planning board members had done anything. I I watched part of that on uh, television, and they seemed extremely ill-informed. They had very little basis. Then they hadn't. If, if if we provided any of our written material to them, that it had not been read, 
And so they were just sort of groping around, and I'm not sure they even wrote it on every one, but they they went through a discussion of the absence. But they didn't refer to themselves as being uninformed, but they obviously <laughs> were. Can we make an explicit invitation to they care to join us on our April 27th field trip? I'm, I'm just a citizen here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but you're on the, on the no, I'm on the traffic and yeah. parking yeah, uh, commission good. as well as the Board of Health. But is there any, I mean... It's a public, I mean, it's an open public meeting. I just, you know, if they want to get a feel for the, our process, invite them. I have a question. Why was the planning board even talking about this? Do they have yeah. some? They have a recommendation per city ordinance, and it's referred from the city council back to us. It also our recommendation also goes to them. Oh, okay. So they're all right. <coughs> Interesting. It, it seemed to me that they had a list of streets, and ju that's just about all they have. Well, I, you know, Gee, no, I didn't know that they were going to have any um, say or had any. Oversight on this, I, I, I had no idea. Although I could see the planning board who has been trying to encourage the infill in downtown as sort of a, mm -hmm. a zoning and land use issue to be concerned about. Yeah, it, it kind of makes sense. Know. I just didn't. I mean, I, didn't I understand know that. the argument that the folks on city court <coughs> are making to us, but we've been trying to do what the city is, has been saying is smart development. Right. You know, and you're not, you know, you're not the. the Cutting back services that actually support those uses. Right, but they didn't. Well, they're making the encouragement out of it. More intense use. They're no planning. Or oh, I know. I know. Whatever their process Thank doesn't you, include Bye. reconfiguring the streetscape to accommodate this, the change from residential to commercial. So, in that regard, I mean, that as developers, they sort of missed that piece. Is there any. So, MJ suggested letting them know when we're scheduling our meeting. Is there any draw downside to that? No. I can have a conversation with Carolyn Mish. We've talked about the private ways before, but she never asked for additional information to bring to the planning board from us. They must be doing their own research. The, the night you and uh, Ned were presenting to the council the budget, I was sitting with Carolyn, and she was showing me some very interesting letters about Bonham's Road. So mm -hmm. I'm sure she was doing her own research to try to provide some background, at least for some of the streets for the planning board. Dirt road. Oh, I remember it well. well. Oh, yeah. I remember it well. Well, and she's also, Carolyn's also neighbors to the Massasoit Ave folks. Okay. All right. Well, I've got nothing. Well, right. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.